Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Discussion Bound. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum, and I'm joined by one of the um, great people in our community, Christina Aronson, um, who will be um, joining me to moderate the program today. And the book that she chose is Women Who Read Are Dangerous. Such a scintillating title <laughs> by Stefan Bullman, uh, the forward by Karen Joy Fowler. And of course, this is a great choice for the month of March, which is Women's History Month. Before we get started, just a few notes. You probably noticed that your microphone and video were muted by default. I'll make that in just a second so that you can unmute your microphone to participate in uh, the conversation today. And you're always more than welcome and even encouraged to turn on your video so that we can see uh, folks instead of little black boxes, names, or still photos, and uh, pretend like we're all sitting in the same room at Malaprops together and talking about this book. Choose a quiet room and close the door. Please do silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be pretty distracting during the conversation. If you do choose to turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement as it makes it difficult for us to hear you. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can join using your smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial, or first name and last name, so that we know who we're talking to. In order to ask questions, make comments, or otherwise contribute during today's book discussion, you can unmute your microphone when Christina or I ask for comments or questions. That's the most uh, expedient way to participate in the one that we encourage. You could also type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar and either Christina or I will call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone. Um, typing in the chat box and raising your hand are perfectly valid and great ways to participate but sometimes can take a while to get to you so please do unmute your microphone when you'd like to contribute. Finally, we are recording. If you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that you might have. So as we always do for Discussion Bound, uh, Christina, uh, primarily Christina, and I contributed a couple of questions, but we developed a, a few questions just to help guide our conversation. Uh, we can use them to get started. We can use them to um, sort of uh, take the conversation in a different direction, but we are not wedded to them. So more than happy to use them as much as we'd like or as little as we'd like. Um, here are the questions and I'm just going to go through them so that we can turn them off of the screen so that we can see each other rather than some still slides the whole time. But I just wanted to run through them. Um, first and foremost, we usually always start with what were your general impressions of the book. Number two, that book title, <laughs> Joey said, I'll say. <laughs> How did you react to the book's title? According to the author, what aspects of women reading are or were considered dangerous? Did the foreword support the book's theme or intention? Why or why not? There was a really interesting quote on page 16 that I think caught both my eye and Christina's eye. Suddenly the crisis is not that women read, but that men don't discuss. The book is an unusual synthesis of social commentary um, on the role of women in society, women's literacy and literacy um, with artwork showing, showing women reading. Is this combination effective um, in your point of view? What do you think was Bullman's intent when writing this book? Why have artists been drawn to women reading as a subject? And I would say, what did the authors think were some of the reasons? And then what did what do you all think might be some others that they missed? Is an artwork depicting a man reading less provocative? Why or why not? Another interesting uh, quote for us to discuss. The short commentaries are intended, intended to support the tour or the artworks. Even images need to be read. Do you agree? Were there any interpretations you found to be spot on or ones that you disagreed with? And I have definitely some contributions to this question. 
Was there a particular artwork that interested, excited, fascinated, or concerned you or otherwise captured your imagination? Please share it. And the vast majority of the artworks included in the book are by man, men, and the author is a man. What might be missing from this study given the lack of a female point of view? So at this point, I'm going to make it so that folks can unmute themselves. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can have a conversation with each other. And uh, I would just ask that unless you are actively contributing to the conversation that you leave your um, microphone muted and just unmute when you would like to speak. So Christina, take it away. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Am I unmuted? We can hear you. Okay, good. I'm so happy to be here today to discuss this book. I'm happy to see some familiar faces and I wish that we were meeting in person because it's been a long time since I've seen some of you. Some of you might not even remember me, but I'm still here. Um, I wanted to just introduce, I mean, there's very, little to introduce on this book. The book sort of says it all, but I thought it was interesting. Maybe some of you read this. Uh, this book was first published in German. The author is obviously German. He's a German writer and publisher. And it was first introduced and published in Germany in 2005. And then in 2006, uh, it was translated into English and it was titled Women Reading. And it wasn't until 2016 that it, uh, a publisher decided to re-bring out this, republish the book and the word women reading are dangerous. They added the word dangerous in 2016. So the addition of that to the title, which I thought was sort of interesting, perhaps to sell books to catch people's attention. If you read reviews online of this book, the reason people uh, were attracted to it, bought it, it's all about the title. Um, you know, they grabbed the book and said, oh, I want to read this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to give it as a gift or whatever. So that's just as a, as a little introduction. Um, the foreword, Karen Joy Fowler, is a woman, even though the author is a man, uh, and she is, as some of you may know, a popular, uh, actually award-winning American author. The book that put her on the map was the Jane Austen Book Club, which some of you may or may not have read, and there was a movie, I think, made out of that. And so I thought it was an interesting choice for this German, originally German book, this art book, that a popular novelist, her genre that she's really best known for is, is science fiction, which has nothing to do with this book, but she's obviously a good writer. So on that note, I would like to open it up to the first question, uh, what were your general impressions with the book. Anybody have a comment? I'm happy to start. <laughs> okay. I thought it was beautiful. I, I love books like this that give you little nuggets that you don't have to read in order, um, that you can sort of thumb through and, and find images that you appreciate or um, are drawn to and then read about them. Um, I'll just come straight out and say I wasn't a big fan of the text that went with the individual artworks, but I really liked Karen Fowler's forward. It made me think about artworks, um, thank you, in a way that I probably hadn't thought about them for a long time. And that's sort of the inner life of the person who's being portrayed and how that's a completely different dimension to what we, the way that, of what we're experiencing aesthetically. I totally agree, Christy. I thought the foreword was great and so expected, I think a little more from the individual ones. The, um, 
title absolutely drew me to it. I had given um, the other one, Woman Reading, to my niece um, before. I didn't realize it was really the same book. Um, <laughs> but because of the title, I thought of about a lot of people I wanted to give it to as a gift. I don't know if I will now, but I think it, it they had to have done it to sell more books. It's uh, very tempting and enticing. I'm okay. Uh, who's Billy? Also... You are muted. So uh, go ahead, Billy. Then Joey. Okay. Um, I I agree with you, Christy, totally. Uh, and I decided after reading a few of the uh, pages and looking at the work to approach it the same way that I approach that website that I subscribe to, Daily Art, and to just look at one and read about one a day. And so I haven't completely finished, but that's okay. And I may start over and do it again, just to look at and really take in and isolate my thoughts towards just that one picture, that one painting, whatever, of that one woman, and give some thought to what the forward talked about is, you know, the inner life and the experience that person is having. Thanks, Billy. Go ahead, Joey. I like the introduction and the kind of the history of reading, which you don't really even think about mm -hmm. in the 21st century um, days. I also like the aspect of just opening the book and just looking at a painting and reading the description they had. You can open it anywhere and it didn't require you to, to have a, you know, the knowledge of the previous pages. That, that I thought was great. So some of you uh, mentioned that the foreword, uh, including Christy, and I agree too, that even though it was very short, that Karen Joy Fowler's foreword really sets the stage for enjoying this book. And it's probably good that it is short because it gives you a lot to think about when you're perusing this book. And I've spent the whole month just having it on my table and picking it up, like you say, once or twice a day and just kind of looking at one painting and putting it down and going to do something else. It's that kind of a book. Did anybody else have comments on the foreword and whether you thought it supported the book or didn't if you read the foreword? Um, were there any other comments about, uh, yes, uh, Jane. Jane. Mm -hmm. So I unmuted, right? Yeah, I just, you're good. I just wondered why people were impressed with the forward. If you could just say a little bit more about what it was that you thought the forward did. Anybody? So for me, um, I think that I, I personally am a trained art historian. And I've worked in museums for almost 20 years. And I think that you get into the habit of mm, thinking about art in a social context. You know, what was going on at the same time that this was made? Why did the artist make it a certain way? What's the artist story? How does it relate to the artist? And in a lot of ways, you start to think in very practical terms rather than sort of creative and imaginative terms. All of those things that when we have programs, <laughs> I encourage you to do, but that I have kind of stopped doing myself. And there's one sort of passage, and Christina, is it okay if I read it? It's, it's what really captured my imagination. And so just bear with me, Jane. Um, it starts on page, at the bottom of page 13, and goes for a couple of short paragraphs, so it'll take maybe a minute to read. She said, we, the viewers, are invited to enter visually, mentally, a place we do not occupy, a garden perhaps, or a sunlit room, in order to watch a woman who is visually, mentally, and yet another place. She might be time traveling 
back to ancient Rome or forward to colonized Mars. She might, while the book lasts, be a completely different person from the one we are seeing. She might be a man. This is all too likely. She might be a horse. And at the very moment we look at her, she might despair, finding herself sold at auction, sent to the glue factory. She might be a rabbit. She might be a hobbit. She might be having trouble concentrating, or she might be spellbound. She might be escaping from boredom into a frothy romantic comedy. She might be reading a Russian novel, a Japanese, assuring herself that others have also had their troubles. She might be pitting her wits against a world-famous detective. She might just need a good cry. Or she might be experiencing some transformation so profound that she will never be quite the same again. And at the very moment we see her, the scales might be falling from her eyes. What's really going on then, the important part of the picture, remains invisible. We will never know where or who she is while reading merely by looking. I just loved that. And it stopped me in my tracks. I read it maybe three or four times and really thought about, you know, how, um, you know, that's probably why the artists were wanting to jump in and, and paint these women uh, or a large reason why they might have wanted to paint them anyway is that you just don't know what's going on in somebody's mind. And I just, that one passage just opened up so much for me and informed the way that I looked at the rest of the book, like Billy kind of maybe setting aside what the art or what the art historian who wrote those passages was saying, but allowing myself to sort of think about what the women who were being pictured were thinking about or where they were um, besides being in a space. Where, what was their headspace? Well, the foreword also adds to the title of the, you know, what is it in the title, this idea of women being dangerous? I had never we, like, I think Joey made the comment of, you know, I'm just a reader. I'm a librarian by profession, a book lover. I never don't have at least two or three books going, but I honestly don't stop and think about the fact that this is something that perhaps I wouldn't have been able to do if I had lived 500 years ago, or that this is a a privilege, as Karen Joy Fowler says at the end, when she talks about how women now have become more bigger readers than men, and there's a sense of concern in the world that men aren't reading enough and women are reading more, that we better take advantage of this while we have it, because we haven't always had that freedom as women to do that. And I guess what the foreword does is sort of set that up in your mind so that as you're looking exactly what Chrissy said, as you're looking at the artworks, you can think about these things that you don't ordinarily look at when you're just looking at a painting in an art museum. Um, does anybody else want to add to that? Oh, Barbara. Uh, Barbara H first, then Barbara P. Oh, sorry, two Barbaras. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, there's another line in the intro that connects to some of what you're saying, which was certainly historically the possibility of a woman with a secret life yeah. has raised alarm mm -hmm. and then talked about, you know, what that meant. And I, when I first read it, was thinking about it historically. And then this week, something strange happened. I'm on a number of Facebook pages about women in reading. Mm -hmm. And this woman posted that she was shamed for reading, that she had posted somewhere that she had read six books this month. And somebody else said, aren't you a teacher? How do you have the time to read? Are you slacking off? <laughs> and it was like amazing mm -hmm. and so much connected to this theme. Um, for me, so that there are still people who sort of shame or think bad of women who read too much because it means that we're idle or not do covering our other responsibilities. 
just when we think we're making progress, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, it was shocking. And it wasn't a man who said it, it was another woman. That's interesting. What a great example, thanks. Barbara Our, P. Barbara Pressman. I think Barbara's, uh, there you go. <laughs> Unstable, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. It says, it says my, uh, okay, because it said my internet's unstable and Barbara was kind of garbled. Um, I didn't think that uh, the title really connected very much to the book, but because maybe women were, tame, were dangerous, I think it was to sell the book when she said, maybe they added it to sell, sell the book. But I think um, what that paragraph said and that Christy read to us has a lot to say about what the artist was trying to show of the individual's character because some of the women are intent on the book. Some are looking very off into the distance. I think it says a lot about the woman and it's a way, it's almost like a prop. The book is a prop to explore the woman the woman's personality or a moment in her life or time. That's how I got the, the I important to me and it does transport me to many different places. And, but I think for the artists, the, the uh, book was a prop to, to explore the personality of the individuals. Um, anybody else? Well, the restriction I, I found interesting because I hadn't given any thought to this really because we pretty much pick up and read whatever we want. We think we do at least. And just this uh, recent uh, event with the Dr. Seuss books uh, or on page 15 of the foreword talking about uh, how um, Reading proposed careful male surveillance. The woman ought to not follow her own judgment uh, that uh, it was another issue of control. And so I started thinking about how men are portrayed in paintings versus women. Uh, if they have a book in their hand, typically it is to demonstrate their intellect. And if you think about the portraits you've seen of men with books, they're, they are typically have the book in their hand or open, closed or open, but they're facing the viewer. And it's more of a power play than, or a power position, I started thinking, than with these portraits of women, uh, all of whom were pretty much absorbed in what they were doing. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, Billy, I too, I... I think that one thing that the art historian who wrote like the rest of the book, Stefan Bullman, he doesn't really acknowledge that there are plenty of paintings of men reading. Um, and I think Karen Fowler kind of, I, I guess she's not an art historian, so she um, may not have that same sort of reference for images, but there are tons and tons of pictures. And, and usually you're right, Billy, it is to indicate that they are learned mm -hmm. um, or in a position of power um, or that, you know, it's some sort of attribute. They are a scribe, they are um, a magistrate, they are um, a prophet. You know, it, it tells you something about the person being pictured, you know, their position in life or society, but. So oh, I just wanted to add that I don't think, I tried to find information on that. I don't think Stefan Bowman, to correct you, is a heart historian. He is a publisher and an editor. And I think that makes a big difference. And uh, Karen Joy Fowler is not an art historian, but no. to address the issue of men in portraits, I don't know if some of you were at the book discussion we did I don't know if it was a year and a half, two years ago, the art of reading. It was two or three years ago. Time is yeah. flying. Which was a similar kind of book, but we had a lot of discussion about uh, artists who deliberately put books, especially in men's hands when their portraits were being painted, to lend credibility, to lend... Um, 
you know, to show their level of education, their level in society, perhaps their uh, adherence to religion, if they were holding a Bible. But it didn't necessarily mean, it wasn't a discussion about whether they were reading it or not. It was how it looked or how they wanted to be portrayed in a painting. Whereas uh, the contrast with this book, I thought, was much more getting an insight into the inner life of somebody who's just sitting quietly in the, in the act of, of reading. Um, so maybe we should uh, move on to another uh, question. I mean, that sort of answers why have artists been drawn to women reading as a subject as uh, opposed to men. I mean, does anybody else have a comment about that? I mean, yes. Um, Michelle? Michelle? Yeah, um, because that's what women did then. They, I mean, that that is, uh, you know, uh, women of a certain class, um, generally, because they were educated beyond a uh, certain grade level. Um, that was one of the, um, like, approved things that women could do in their leisure and almost expected to do, like studying music and playing an instrument. So um, I think that uh, the, the one picture that was actually surprising to me um, was one of a woman from, it, it was like old times. She looked like a religious person. And I was surprised to see that because I don't think of women at that time period being uh, reading prolifically or uh, you know, at all at, at leisure. So to even have an artwork that shows that. So, what page was that one, Michelle? Oh, I don't know. I just I just flipped through it, but it looked like a it looked like a um, um, what do I want to say? A, you know, a religious painting. It was that kind of a look. I think it's at the beginning of the section on uh, one reading. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. Was it the one on page 51? Mary? I don't Can know. Enunciate? I think that was possibly. <laughs> You're all We're looking, all looking at it towards I'll, the beginning I'll, I'll of the I'll book. <laughs> I think where the prophet is. Oh, Pat, that that one that Pat is holding up is oh. one of those that really yeah. caught my eye. Yeah. yeah, I love that, that one. The, that is the cover of the other book that's called Women Reading. Oh, interesting. That picture is on the cover. Oh, yes. It says that in the explanation of that particular artwork. Um, I read that. Sure. I'll find it for you guys. So continue with the conversation. I'll let you know what page it's on. So, so Christina, Barbara H. pointed out in the um, chat box that this same author, Stefan Bullman, also wrote the book, Women Who Write Are Dangerous. And you and I had talked about, should we choose women who write are dangerous or women who read are dangerous for, for the book group? And I'm wondering if he just titled it, it sort of changed the title from Women Reading, and you, you're the one who sort of looked at other, you know, the history of the book. When the other book came out, did he do that to sort of differentiate um, them? The my understanding was that the book on women writing came out after the book on women reading. And so it followed it. Um, I have not looked at it. I have not had a copy of it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I might be drawn to, to order it and, and look at it. Just to see. <laughs> we should have a part two. <laughs> you know, I, I have to... I don't know why I feel this way, but I have a feeling that, you know, somebody mentioned throwing the word in dangerous was a ploy to sell this book. It obviously works because, um, you know, Linda said she had the earlier version, which does not have the word dangerous in it. 
And when he went ahead to publish another book about women writing, he made sure to put in that word dangerous. Um, I don't know anything else. Does anybody, has anybody else come across that book? I would look it up. Have you looked at that book, Barbara? Is that why you mentioned it? Or did you just notice that there were two um, for sale? I've looked at it. Um, and it has okay. portraits of all the authors, all the women writers. Oh, so that that part was nice. So it's I haven't read it, but I just I glanced at it. If you're more interested than in writers, perhaps, and what they look like, uh, and maybe in the act of doing their writing, that would appeal, um, yeah, uh, in a more uh, literary sense than women reading. Yeah, I will be re interested in reading his summaries and seeing if I disagree with him as much as I did <laughs> with this book. So with while this you book. mentioned that, why don't we um, throw out who would like to talk about one of the paintings that struck you and also your reaction, because I know it's a very uh, controversial thing about whether we should have a painting explained to us or whether we should be allowed to just look at it. And that concerned me when I was going through this book. But at the same time, uh, you know, I found myself reading under each picture. A lot of the artists I'm not familiar with. So does anybody, would anybody like to mention Joey? Funny, I love abstract expressionism. But the painting in this book that really caught my attention was the first one, Simone Martini. The what page, page, Joey? Page 40. All right. It's an altarpiece, and it's in the Uffizi Gallery. <clears throat> A number of things about this. First of all, my great-grandfather's name was Archangelo Gabriel. So this, this <laughs> wow. really, you know, I helped me. Um, the, the wings on the angel are translucent. You can see the, the architecture through them. The uh, angel's cape is like fluttering in the background. Um, the Virgin Mary is like caught at this moment of trepidation and she's, you know, she's a little afraid of what's happening. And, you know, there's a book there, which, you know, in 2000 years ago, they didn't have books, but this is like a 14th century modernization of the painting. But the most interesting thing is the um, the speaking voice of the angel going across to the Virgin's ears. It's like a Roy Lichtenstein uh, pop art painting to me. I thought oh, that's fascinating. I would have never noticed that at all until it was pointed out in the description. You don't even, you can't really see it. But I, I just thought this was must have been very innovative at the time. It's, it's a pretty common way um, at this time in the 14th century to represent speaking. And you're right, Joey, I love it. And I wonder if because that's not a way, well, I guess, you know, we have word bubbles. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, the Lichtenstein word bubble. Yeah, <laughs> but you're right. I wonder, you know, if you had just seen this painting without having that description on the side if you would have thought oh interesting there's writing you know on the painting um but you wouldn't have thought you know that it's representing the voice of the angel you yeah. know going into mary's ear i just i don't know i i don't i'm not usually drawn to religious paintings but this one really got me I liked this one uh, too, Joey, uh, because I noticed for the first time, and I've seen this painting probably a gazillion times, but it was the first time I noticed that the underside of the angel's garment, it looked like plaid. Oh. And I just thought that that was really... Yeah, the cape, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that it was, um, <laughs> it just seemed out of place to me. Michelle, you had your hand up. Yeah, that, that's very interesting, the plaid. So, um... So interesting what you said, Christy, because being a, a trained docent at the museum and that um, the museum industry is really about having people engaged in the artwork and seeing what they see in it, as opposed to being a lecture-oriented 
uh, tour guide. That's and how we do it. That's not how every museum does it. It isn't? I, I thought it was, um, no. okay, well, good to know. Um, and I, I think that there's a really nice um, balance that can be had between those two in that I know being a museum goer, I would go to a museum and, and read all the info cards for a while and then I would just like be overwhelmed and I would just look to, you know, be interested in, in the artwork and see what I saw in it. Um, and I, I just, I think it's nice to have a little bit of the information to be able to go, oh yeah, look at that or what that, or what the artist actually means rather than our interpretation of it. Well, what's interesting though, is that if we would have looked at this painting together in the galleries, someone, whether it was Joey or someone else would have noticed the words. And then the docent would have pointed out that's the way that the artist has represented the, the angel speaking. So, I mean, it would have come out eventually, but it's kind of nice to discover it rather than having someone tell you. Barbara? I like when someone points out some information that I would miss. I don't like as much when someone points out the emotions of the characters that are represented or the artist. So even with this one, I was surprised when the author said her startled attitude. And I'm going, she doesn't look startled to me. <laughs> she doesn't look startled to me either. <laughs> you know, so that someone's interpreting feelings you know, and I think that's all, um, even when we do VTS, mm -hmm. um, that there's a lot of projection. Um, but I would rather, you know, well, learn that for myself. But there's a lot of imagery in here that I just don't have the background, religious, historical, to, to look at the painting. And I, that part, I really appreciate. I'm wondering, because you had said that you um, you didn't agree with a lot of what he had written, and if it was more sort of his interpretation of something, um, his personal interpretation or his reading, she looks startled, the angel looks interest. you know, when you start putting the adjectives on it that can be very subjective, if that's what it was that rubbed you the wrong way rather than what he was talking about in general? I think probably both, but more so the, the, um, the interpretation of feelings or, yeah. yeah. But there are some things that the content is like, wow, I don't see that. Yeah. <laughs> Christina, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. About, you know, some of the um, emotions I didn't agree with, but one uh, photograph on page 147 that drew me in, and you can all probably guess why, not, it's the, um, the photograph of Marilyn Monroe, who, by the way, happens to be photographed by a woman photographer. I made a note of that. But the fact I was so caught up in the explanation of how she actually was holding uh, Ulysses James Joyce. Talk about a contrast between the stereotype you have of Marilyn Monroe and probably the greatest book in all of literature. And then the explanation that followed um, by, you know, some he went and explored whether she actually was reading this book, was she not? Um, but that just drew me right into this photograph. And I think if I had seen this photograph in a museum, I can't see from, at least from my picture, that what book she's reading and why she's so intent on reading this. Um, and so there's a piece of information that I wouldn't, have caught, you know, and I might have just said, oh yeah, there's Marilyn Monroe and walked past it. I, I don't know if anybody else had that reaction. Anybody else have a painting they, or a 
photograph that they that struck them? I just um, this particular one of Marilyn Monroe really. Um, I stayed with it for a really long time, and the information. And I personally enjoy both. I mean, I go there and experience the painting, and I I really also enjoy the information and giving me an opportunity to think about things I might not have thought about. And what struck me in all of the paintings is the um, position that the artist, the models were put in. And having done a lot of life drawing classes and even modeled once years ago, um, I know how hard that is for the person modeling. And they, if they don't take themselves away I mean, sometimes some of those positions are really hard. There was one where she's leaning on her arms and I'm thinking, really? I mean, they, they you know, do this for days, sometimes weeks in the same position. I know we were very considerate of the models that we had and we would take a lot of breaks. But I, that, that really affected me in, in all the paintings and I, I love the book. I love it. I think I love all the... Um, learning about artists I never knew about. There are a lot of artists in here that I never heard of. So that was kind of interesting too. Um, but I, you know, each painting just held its interest for me. You know, I didn't look at every one of them yet. It's the kind of book where I pick it up and look at it and then put it down um, and just have it hanging around so I can study it. But it's just, um, I, I just, I just loved it. And I think the positions of the artists really, of the uh, models really got to me. It's like, why, why in that position? And, um, and what are they thinking? I happen to be reading a book right now um, by Julia Blackwell, who wrote several books about France. And she, this one book is about a model and what the model does to get herself away from what she's actually doing and where her mind goes and, and, and her reading also. It's, it's, you know, it kind of goes from the 16th century to present day. And so um, it was interesting to be looking at this book and reading that novel as well. It's called Letters from Paris. Um, anyway, that's my comments right now. <laughs> Thanks, Norma. One of the things that makes this book especially nice is the quality of the paintings and the pages. Mm -hmm. I recently got out the art of reading and there's no comparison in, you know, I have a little art gallery right here within this book, but it doesn't pull me to it the way this does because I can sit here and look at these gorgeous I mean, it's the quality of the paper and the printing, which has, you know, and, and like you, Norma, I was very drawn to the unusual um, paintings where perhaps we see the back of somebody or we see her at an odd angle and it makes you feel like you're really uh, spying on somebody who has no idea that you're looking at them. And when the paintings are as beautifully done as some of these, you know, I mean, to, to uh, feel that way, just as a, an observer of a painting, to feel like I'm in some secret place looking at someone as if they're about to, you know, they could turn around at any minute, notice me and then might change what they're doing, says a lot for some of the artworks. There was, um, so I, I agree with you about, um, from a different perspective, I'm not an artist, but I like, um, I like the paintings, particularly, for example, on page 56, uh, you know, the maid who's sitting with her back to us and the things you can glean, uh, you know, she's reading while we're watching, but she has no idea that we're watching. I, I like that. And the, and the close-ups, they have, 
across the book, the little close-ups of part of the painting, which, you know, I have to look at these things with a magnifying glass because I can't even <laughs> see anymore. But I love that aspect of it because it really drew you into the painting even more. Yeah. Yeah. Jane, you had your hand up. Did you want to share an artwork that you particularly liked with us? So Jane, you're muted. I was drawn there to the go. picture, the Rembrandt picture on page 52 of the old woman reading. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, I think, and this is kind of the way that I am noticing, the way I'm noticing the world these days is that I'm, I'm drawn more to things that are particular to me. So I'm having a problem with arthritis in my hands. So as soon as I saw this, and I realized by reading the description that, that you know, purposefully the book and the hand are almost backlit, but I was drawn to look at her hand because it's just something that, you know, is very personal to me. And like Joey was saying, I went actually and got my, my old magnifying glass here because I really wanted to see, like, does that look like my hand? You know, because like I'm, a, I'm an expert on what, what an old hand should look like. And I mean, I just, I was very drawn to it and I thought it was really beautiful. I think I really need a magnifying glass. Magnifying glass. I love how people are just holding it up like it's always <laughs> there. Specifically for the painting, the small painting on page 22 because this is the one that he says is about masturbation. I thought I would get, but my first inclination was that it was satire and that it's called The Reader and that it's really about somebody who like fell asleep and dropped the book. <laughs> How many times have y'all read a book where you were so into the book and it's like you even wanted to stop reading as fast so that you never got to the last page because you knew it would be over? But how many times have you like closed the book and you don't even want to put it down? You sort of, you know, live with it a little bit. Um, you know, because you don't want it to end. You don't want to leave that world, you know, and you just sort of sigh that's what I read and then I thought masturbation okay I wouldn't have gone there but if that's what people think sure right and maybe with a magnifying glass I would have noticed more of the features that he I checked. no you wouldn't <laughs> okay. no, no thank you Joey uh -uh. no that's in the, that's in the interpreter's mind not in the painting I would say I agree with you Joey not there <laughs> But the thing is, Christy, what you're saying is she's, you know, her bosom is exposed. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I think I would notice if, if, if I was reading and all of a sudden everything started falling out, you know. I mean, it's not a casual thing that happens <laughs> to me, you know. I think this is a ridiculous looking painting. You might like, feel, feel a, a draft. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> You did it? Oh, oh, Pat's got out her magnifying glass. Joey, now look too. again. <laughs> it means just a low cut down. She has her hand in her pocket. And we know about men with their hands in their pocket. Oh, yes. I don't know about you guys, but my hands and feet get very cold year round. And so I will sit on my hands. Um, sometimes just to warm them up, you know. I will photograph I you doing it. Oh, I swear. <laughs> it happens a lot. My husband can attest to my cold hands. And I, well, feet, you Billy. know, this leads me to what I found interesting, and that was that there were a number of uh, nudes reading. And I always call me a clothes, clothes horse, but. I usually am dressed when I'm reading and, and not lying in some uh, draped kind of way. So I found that uh, those paintings were, there wasn't just one, there were several, uh, somewhat uh, unusual. Or contrived. Prop. Exactly, Barbara. I remember back to what yeah. Barbara had said earlier about the book as prop. Yeah. 
many of these paintings to me that struck me that it's just there as a prop. It's not really about, even if you call it the reader, it's not, some of them are clearly make you think about reading, but some of them it's just, it's just there as a prop. I mean. Look, look at page 121, I'm sorry, 119. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that to me just, <laughs> I mean, I never stand around naked and read. I never do it. <laughs> but now I think what about works. what Norma said and about um, models and having to hold a yeah. pose. And honestly, if I'm having to sit in a certain way for a long time, I'm going to take that's a book right. or something so that's to when read. You, when they were talking, when you guys were talking about that, I thought, well, maybe that's what she's doing is maybe it, she's modeling for painters or sculptors and she's amusing herself by reading. Well, it does say that he's painted her, she is his model and he's painted her lying down as well as right this right. way. So it's just a variance and a prop, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, going. Pat, you had your hand yeah. up. I was just going to say on page 143, the hopper. Yeah. 143? Yeah, 143. Um, I found that. Oh, this one, yeah, yeah. I really loved it because I felt like it opened so many questions there, just as a painting itself. And of course, she's not reading a book, but a pamphlet, you know, kind what of. What page are you on? 143. Also, does she have underwear on? I mean, she has like a little camisole. <laughs> I thought it was like a little teddy or it's, something. Yeah, it's just a little teddy, but I, I don't think she has anything else on. And so, you know, since we're talking along this line, I thought I found that one intriguing and disturbing to me. Mm. I thought it... I mean, I've always been a big fan of Hopper anyway. And, um, you know, the alienation that he discusses and everything. And then the other one that I just totally Before, before, before you leave that, before you leave that. Could, Hold on, Pat. Yeah, could, before you leave that, uh, and what he says about this painting is, Hopper's readers are not dangerous, but endangered. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, do you see her as endangered here? I disagreed with a lot of his discussions. I felt that his lack of art history surfaced in this, but then also this book was not produced as a dissertation for art historians. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think you have to look at it from that, you know, with that in mind. I, I don't see her as endangered, but I do know that Hopper's work creates a vacancy or a, an aloneness, a sense of aloneness. And then you think about women traveling on business alone in hotel rooms and how it's probably safer now than it was, but at one time it was considered pretty dangerous for women to travel alone. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I looked at it that way. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Pat. You had a second one you were going to point yeah. out? Yeah, the Marilyn Monroe one on page 147. I, I just, I had never seen um, this kind of interpretation, I don't think, of Marilyn Monroe. I just thought it was a, a beautiful work. Yeah. Um, and what is it? Who is it? She's reading James or jo James Joyce, yeah. Ulysses, which I've never read, Christina. So, do you recommend it? Um, not unless you're not doing anything else in your life for the next year. Okay, uh, I think I'll skip it for now then. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara P., I think you had your hand up. You're muted, Barbara. There you so go. Being a, a mother and a teacher, I was drawn a lot to the ones with the children. And this one on what? page 123. 123. 
again, uh, with what he said about the picture. Now I looked at the picture and then he, at the very end, he said, this one has something sinister and terrifying in it. And I didn't see anything sinister or terrifying in the picture. Um, I saw a mother reading to a daughter. Maybe I see a little jealousy of the older daughter, but nothing sinister. Um, I thought he was projecting something, you know, kind of negative into what I thought wasn't a really negative picture. Yeah. Or painting. I didn't, I don't know. And there was another one with the, uh, read, I can't, I don't remember the page, but um, it was a little girl being, who wasn't looking at the book. She was looking away at the camera, uh, looking away at the painter. And he said that she was disengaged. I, I just thought that he was, I didn't like his interpretations of the, of the paintings. Yeah. One Christina. Does, does anyone find this picture, does Sorry. anybody find this picture uh, terrifying? No. Or sinister? <laughs> it looks really sweet, actually. <laughs> but but, but you find yourself wanting to ask him, well, what do you see that makes you say that? Right. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. <laughs> All the docents can yeah. laugh now. Okay. So, uh, the one that I was really struck by, um, Christina, was the Vermeer. Oh, yes. But not because, I mean, it's a beautiful painting, but I just wholeheartedly disagreed with his reading. Um, he, had, he had said um, that she must have been reading a letter from her husband who was represented in the map. Page 57. Oh yeah, sorry, page 57. She says, he says, the woman apparently pregnant has turned toward the window and stands reading a letter that she has probably received from her husband. The map of Southeast Holland on the wall in the background alludes to the absent writer. And I just, as soon as he said husband, I thought to myself, this is a man looking at the painting and inserting in the painting what he wants to see. Because I could think of a thousand other people that that letter could be from. Like, for example, if she is a woman who has left her home uh, and gone into her husband's home and she's by herself now and pregnant, you know, wouldn't she be thinking about like her sister or her mother or some other woman, you know, who she would love to be there to help her through this process. <laughs> you know, there were so many other people I could think of that that letter would be from. And I just thought it was, you know, something to me that was, um, I think lacking in the book was that woman's point of view. Since so many of the paintings that he chose were by men, and he was interpreting them as a man from a very decidedly male perspective um, that I would have liked to have seen a lot more paintings, photographs, sculptures. I mean, where are the sculptures in here? Um, by women and having a, a real sensitivity then to alternate readings of how they could be interpreted, which is why I think I really enjoyed the forward so much because it was from such a different perspective and encouraged you to be creative and open-minded. It was also by a woman. That's what I mean. <laughs> I mean, you know, incidentally, it was also uh, by a woman. Incidentally, but. it was the only woman's voice that we hear in this book. And that's probably a big flaw. Again, my feeling the whole time I was looking at this book and reviewing it and trying to find information, I think it's a book that was put together and that someone, they were trying to make money. He was mm -hmm. trying to make money. It's a publisher's book. There are a lot, we've talked about a lot of redeeming qualities about it. And I think we'll all in our own way continue to enjoy our copies if we bought a copy and pick it up every now and then. But it's not the greatest, you know, art book that ever was. And, you know, it's not really written by any great expert. But that's okay, because visually, it's beautiful to look at, I think. 
I totally agree with you, Christina. It's a good book in spite of his writing. Yeah. And, and I think I will... Barbara, we can't hear you. Looking at pictures without his commentary. Right. Yeah. Well, that's easy to do, to just, yes. just blot out the commentary and just enjoy the paintings. My next, I, my next try through. <laughs> Go ahead, Joey. I didn't really mind his descriptions because I always look for myself anyway. For example, the um, picture that someone pointed out, the, the, a studious young girl, I didn't think her age was that uh, ascertainable from the picture. And what I also page? thought, page 74. And I also, I also thought she was pregnant. But he says it's her knees in the picture. But it's it, it seemed like she she could have been a young woman, not a young girl, reading a book. So I I, I didn't mind. I just I interpret for myself. I thought is she pregnant because that's a strange way to sit to read a book. I think. Page seventy four. It's a Vermeer that uh, we were talking about. Page. Oh, no, not on page 74, sorry. I'm contrasting it with the, with the- Oh, the one that we haven't talked about. Yeah, this one here. Yeah, I didn't the realize those were her knees until I read this. I thought she was just sitting there and, and maybe, I mean, does it look like she's, so she must be sitting down on the floor with her arms around her knees? Right, so I think you can see it both ways, um, that she either is pregnant and she's got the book propped on her belly, yes. or she's sitting with her knees drawn up and those are her knees. You can, well, I think you can uh, see it both ways. The commentary says it's her knees. Well, but we, we've already established that we can challenge the commentary. <laughs> His is just one opinion and ours are fine too. <laughs> we have a lot of good opinions in this group and yeah. such an educated group. Does anybody have anything else they would like to add or didn't get a chance to say because it's already one? This has been fun book to talk about. Linda. I was just going to say, I really enjoyed the one on 139 in her red dress and the little kids' toys sitting next to her. Mm. Yeah, I love that red dress. I have a pretty similar one that's navy blue, but this red was killing me. I love it. And her shoes and the, the, the detail on the chair. I just, that very much, the colors very much drew me to her. Yeah, he had nothing nice to say about her, did he? No, I didn't. I ignored him. <laughs> If you ignore the the writing next to that painting, it annoyed me. The melancholy and again, its feelings interpreting uh, what to him he saw, but maybe the somebody else wouldn't. That's not good. He even <laughs> compared her face to the dog in the picture. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It's really terrible. Really? <laughs> X, let's X that page out. <laughs> See, now, Pat, this is the point where I wish Mike was here because Mike always, you know, has his comment. Well, I'm no artist, but, you know, but I, I thought that this book would probably really appeal to Mike because it was open to interpretation um, and had a lot to look at. And I know that he likes to sort of read the words first, then look at the images. So tell Mike he's not allowed to skip. I find it interesting that I think our expectation in reading a book is that we're going to gain and gather information and insight based on what the author has to say. As docents, if you had this guy in a tour and he said this about the painting, you would shake your head yes and say, well, what is it that you see that makes you say that? And what do other people think? <laughs> and what do other people? And so right. now we've had a chance to find out what other people think. So yeah, it's been nice. Christy would call on someone else. Yeah, I'd say, okay, good, Linda. What do you? Think? <laughs> <laughs> this has been a really fun discussion, guys. Thank you, Christina, for. Thank you.
Oh, for writing book. this book and leading us today and developing these questions to, to get us talking. Do you have any final thoughts, Christina? No, I, I'm really glad we did this book. It was a lot of fun. It's not perfect, but it was a lot of fun to do. It was lighter. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's open to interpretation I'm thinking now a lot about literacy, women's history, which I wouldn't have ordinarily done. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Christy, for giving me the opportunity to every now and then to do a fun book, especially a book connected to, to reading and literature. I appreciate that. I'm not opposed to fun. <laughs> <laughs> And whenever I, I see a book that marries uh, art and literature, art and reading, art and words, I always think of you, Christina. So thank you for, for taking the time to, to read and, and again, to put this together. Um, thank you to all of you for coming. We had a really fun discussion today. I've laughed a lot and we all need a, a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> in these strange times. Um, next month, we meet on Tuesday, April the 13th. Um, again, via Zoom. I think we'll probably be on Zoom for a while. And our book is Beaufort Delaney and James Baldwin, Through the Unusual Door. And it's a, a book that was published in conjunction with an exhibition uh, at the Knoxville Museum of Art, I want to say last year, uh, and I think that it was, uh, the exhibition was the same name as the book, and so this book was published in conjunction with that exhibition, and the Knoxville Museum of Art, <clears throat> Knoxville is the birthplace of Beaufort Delaney, um, and they have uh, one of the largest collections of uh, Delaney art and ephemera in the world, and so um, really um, looking at the affinities between Beaufort Delaney and James Baldwin, who were great friends and had really similar trajectories in their lives. Malaprops does not currently have this book. Um, Joey's got a copy. Joey, where did you get your copy? From the museum. From the um... Knoxville Museum? Okay. That's where I've told Malaprops to go to probably get some copies. So I'm hoping that they will have some in stock. If you'd like to get your copy from Malaprops, you can uh, also do what Joey did and reach out to the Knoxville Museum of Art, see if you can order uh, a copy from them. Um, but I would recommend if this subject matter is interesting to you, that you start looking for your book sooner rather than later to make sure that you have time to get it and read it. One of the authors, uh, Mary Campbell, who is um, a professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, will be our special guest. And she is um, a specialist in um, uh, Delaney and uh, Baldwin and sort of uh, their relationship and uh, the history behind uh, the time. So it'd be really interesting to have a guest speaker um, to come in and help us uh, unpack the um, subject matter in the book. And that book was chosen in conjunction with an exhibition called Beaufort Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom that will open here at the museum starting April the 1st. Uh, you probably have gotten a postcard about that um, exhibition. Uh, we do have the members preview, I believe the previous day. Um, so if you are a museum member, you you can go online and get your uh, free ticket to the members preview. Christy, mm -hmm. even on Amazon, the book is very difficult to get. Yes. It's $30 and it usually ships within one to two months. Months, right. So, so maybe yes. as jo Joey, I'm doing. guessing that Joey hit the nail on the head to go straight to the source, uh, the Knoxville Museum of Art. It was co-published by the Knoxville Museum of Art and the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. So I'm thinking that that's the best way um, to get it. One thing is, is that their exhibition opened right before COVID closed us all down. So they probably have a lot of copies that they wouldn't mind us taking off their hands. Just, I, can, I bought this book as a result of the tour of that museum that you had the virtual tour. I was so interested in it. So, but it came very quickly and they had they had inventory. I, I, did, I would normally buy something at Malprops. But. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I had suggested late last week that Justin reach out to um, 
uh, the museum to, to get copies of the book that they probably, as I said, wouldn't mind getting getting some of those moved. But at any rate, that's what we're going to read. And I'm always excited um, to have, you know, co-moderators co like Christina and presenters like Mary Campbell come and help us um, sort of work through the book. So I'm excited about it. And uh, we've got some time because the, the second Tuesday in April falls in the middle of the month. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Uh, always a pleasure to see you and talk to you. As I said, Pat, tell Mike he's not allowed to skip. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Thanks. Bye. Bye.